There we go. Well, welcome back from the second exam. Um, we have a nice, quiet day today of textbook material. I'm looking at the logbook. It's actually one of the rare days that there aren't any, uh, you know, reminders right here. We're working in Chapter 10. So I'm just going to repeat the title of it here, Inventory Management. We got a good start last Thursday. The second exam had not yet happened yet. We're going to keep talking about the EOQ model. Then we're going to talk about its cousin, the EPQ model. And then we're working our way up to reorder points. Whoops, reorder is what I'm trying to write points. Because we had said, and I'll, I'll point something out, that all of inventory management is how much and when. This stuff in here we're talking about right now, we're talking about determining how much, basically. Reorder points, when we get to it, that's the when part. You know, all of inventory management is how much and when. Now, we're going to work on that today. I thought, though, for, let me change the view here, for a few, just a, let's take a breather here for a few minutes. Uh, and do a little recap concerning the class and kind of where we are in the calendar. Uh, oh, this is our UB Learn site. This is the landing page. Oh, and first off, I have to apologize. You guys get the email about the second exam. Oh, I'm sorry. I was sweeping our landing page. You know, those emails that you get, they say they're from me, but it says no reply at UB Learns. What they are is their announcements. But I've also checked because I'm pushing out information, you know, to email. Okay, well, that was hanging there, and that announcement's no good. And so I go into UB Learns, I go into Blackboard, which you pay a lot of money for, and I say, all right, I'm changing the availability of that just because we just don't need it hanging in front of us, right? Submit. And in submitting it, it emailed it again. So I'm sorry. I know you get a ton of junk email, and I'm sorry that I was contributing to that. Uh, I will try to uh, throttle it in the future that it doesn't do that. Okay, so this is one of our you know, few quiet days in the uh, class calendar. Uh, Jasmina is uh, working really hard, and she says actually for exam two, she says she's seeing a lot of good grades. So I think we'll have some good news to share with a lot of people. Probably, you know, remember this is Tuesday after the exam in real time, probably in a couple days. We'll have everything cross-checked and posted. When we do, there'll be an important milestone actually in our class because a little bit after that, I will finalize the grading scale. We've got a early grading scale in your syllabus, and I'm not going to raise any one of those things, but I'm going to flesh the whole thing out and freeze it. And then we will have another very important like 10-minute talking class about strategizing for the end of the semester. Right now, though, we're still waiting on the last um, of that data. This is uh, congratulations again to uh, all of our competition winners. This was from Native Sun. And right, in a little while, I'll also release the information about your second project. Not that right, right now in real time, that needs to be something that you're real worried about. I know, rest a little bit. But I know some people like to look at stuff, kind of scout it early. So that's coming up. Um, any questions? All right, then let's just let's just work some in chapter ten today. What were we doing? We were talking about how much you should order. Let me switch the view back to the visualizer. Oh, right, because we had eight thousand of some mythical item, and we were experimenting with order sizes that we had actually illustrated here in a sawtooth diagram. Maybe order 8,000, maybe order 2,000. We had calculated the cost, because this is how we would pick a policy, for two different order sizes based on this is where we left it on Thursday. OK, this right here, this equation at the bottom of what is that? No, page 92. I'm going to copy it from memory on the board. It is the total relevant cost of any particular order size. You say D divided by Q times S plus Q divided by 2 times H. All those squares that I had drawn 
just before we ended class on Thursday, right? Because this is the total ordering cost. This is the total holding cost. That's the actual number of orders in here. And this is the average inventory level in here, at least theoretically. Oh, and why did we even care about that? Because this formula right here just, OK, I know it's early days. It's actually still a while now in real time. But you know, for the third exam, this is a you know, perfect material for uh, the formula sheet. And this one formula, if you know how to take it apart, is actually a bunch of different formulas. Or it could answer a bunch of different questions, including Last time we calculated the cost of ordering all 8,000 at once, and it was 12,000 some odd dollars. And then we calculated the cost of ordering them one at a time, and it was ridiculous. It was like over $200,000. We had illustrated the prospect of ordering 2,000 at a time. Is that any better? One thing I'm trying to point out here with this, this formula is you can use this formula to entertain any possible order size. So like in the case of Q equals 2,000, I would take that 8,000 divided by 2,000. Oh, right. If you order 2,000 at a time, you're going to order you know, four times a year. Times that 30 plus 2,000 divided by 2 times that H. What was it? 3? So this would work out to four times a year at $30 is just like 120 bucks in ordering costs plus 2,000 divided by two is 1,000 times three. You do pay more in holding costs, but we're concerned with the combined effect, 3,120. And that number is the lowest number we've seen so far. So far, we've only looked at three. And if we wanted to, we could keep hunting around and seeing if we could find something that resulted in a lower number. That's the whole point in picking a smart. Remember it said what or how much is fixed, but pick something that's economical, something that's smart, right? Pick something that, that keeps this to a minimum. Oh, right. And this is all a segue, actually, if you like skip the uh, or turn the page in the skeleton notes. The top of the next page, doesn't it say what would be the best order size? The best order size would be the order size that comes out with the absolute smallest number for that. And we could keep picking numbers and searching for it. Although, obviously, there's a much more convenient way to do that. OK, this right here, how do we find the one value for Q that minimizes this entire expression? Well, this entire expression actually creates a U-shaped curve. I'll prove that to you in a moment. Does anybody remember from MTH, is it 141 you guys had to take? Calculus? Did I get that right? Was it 141? 121. 121? Oh, you took a special one, I think. 131. Well, OK, yes. Never mind. Calculus. Oh, I have, a, I have this. I have a U-shaped curve. Right, and I want to find the minimum point in it. It's a function of one thing right here. I take the first derivative with respect to q. I set it equal to 0, and I solve for q, and that spots you the low point on the curve. Does that bring back any memories? Yeah. That's the process. Now, if that doesn't bring back any memories, OK, right, don't panic, per se, because I'm not going to require you to take the first derivative with respect to any variable You know, set it equal to 0. But what is an important learning outcome for MGO302 is the result of that. Because the result of that is the EOQ formula. If you want to order, if you want to identify the absolute best order size, or Q, I'll write OPT for optimal. You don't actually have to audition a bunch of order sizes as long as you can remember this formula. Take the square root of 2 times d times s divided by h. Just fill that out. That will spot you the absolute lowest cost order size. Oh, OK. I was just talking about where, huh, why that's where it came from. Now, let's do that for this particular problem. That would be the square root of 2 times the d is 8,000. S is the fixed cost, that's 30, divided by 3. 
And for this problem, yeah, you know, because it was in lecture, I actually cooked the numbers a little bit that when you take the square root, it comes out nice and neat. An order size needs to be generally in whole numbers because you're talking about a number of things and it just volunteers itself that way. 400, you say, well, what is that supposed to mean? Oh, you should order these things 400 at a time. I mean, that's, it, that's what that means. You, if the only thing that you're worried about is minimizing costs, you should order these things 400 at a time. Oh, okay. Now, having answered the question, I actually just set the policy because I said that's really what we're doing right now in Chapter 10. We're talking about how you create a policy and put it into place. Every time you need more, order 400. Um, okay, now we have a policy. Now that we have a policy, we can answer questions about the policy. For instance, suppose we make this our policy. I mean, why wouldn't we? It's supposed to be the lowest cost order size. What is actually the cost of that policy? Well, that's where you just parade that formula back out again. This time, use the 400. So, let's see, 8,000 divided by 400 times 30 plus 400 divided by 2 times the same old 3. I get that this part right in here, that that's 600, and that this part right in here, that's 600. You add them together for $1,200. That is the cost of the optimal policy. Notice it is lower than the 3,120 that we just got. My scratch work on the board, and it's certainly lower than the 12,000 and the over 2,000. That is the lowest possible cost you could hope for. Um, now, I want to point something out right there. It, the 1,200 is the result of 600 plus 600. Go back to the computer. Yes, we don't need UB Learns though. I hope I have it open. I want to show you a graphic from the book. The 600 plus 600, it's not a coincidence. Okay, when you were trying to pick an order cost manually, this was the problem. These two different sets of costs, holding costs versus ordering costs, they fight each other. Because the larger your order size, oh, basic inventory dynamics, always good to just be aware of. The larger your order size, the higher your inventory levels, the more you pay in holding costs. Pick a bigger number, pay more in holding costs. But ordering costs, since you have to pay for each order, let's think about it. It works in the opposite direction, just basic inventory dynamics. The larger your order size, the less frequently you have to order, right? Because you get a bunch in which is to say the larger your order size, the lower your ordering costs. The two things are fighting. We're just trying to find the one value that finds the best compromise. This is what, oh, which is to say we don't care about that one and we don't care about that one in particular. We care about their combined effect. That's where we get, I mentioned, you know, from MTH 131, a, sort of a U-shaped curve meaning that there is an absolutely perfect order size because this is cost, right, where it bellies out and it's the lowest. Notice that the optimal order size, and it's just the structure of the situation, is right where these two things cross, which is to say if you have found the very best order size, ah, interesting. You're also finding the one order size in which your holding costs and your ordering costs theoretically are balancing. Oh, which is to say on a more practical level, if you're working a problem and you're asked for the EOQ, the economic order quantity, the very best order size or the order size that minimizes your combined costs, and then later you're asked for the cost of that policy, you should see that in your scratch work. You should see ordering costs and holding costs. They might be off by a couple decimal places if when you took the square root for the order size, you know, you kind of had to round. But you, they, should be, they should be basically matching. If they're not, then something went wrong someplace in the calculations. They should match. Okay, so we have a little check on our math there. Now, we still have this policy. We're going to order them uh, 400 at a time. 
because that will minimize the costs. We can answer some more questions about the policy. Let me see. Okay, so suppose we propose that and people think, God, oh, that's really small number. You know, if we order these 400 a time, aren't we going to be ordering like all of the time? Well, I don't know. How many times a year will we actually order if we do that? That's just D divided by Q, right? That's that component of the total cost right there. So in our case, 8,000 divided by the 400 is 20, 20 times a year. I don't know if you think that's frequent or not, but that's the case if we use that particular order size. Now, how much time will pass between placing one order the next, or what is the length of the order cycle? Or another way to think about that is if you had actually drawn Q equals 400 here, what would be the length of the base of each one of those teeth? Or another way to think about that is if you order 400, how long is 400 going to last you? I just gave you a whole series of ways of, of asking about the order cycle. How long will 400 last? Now, the way that I like to remember that is you take the D divided by Q and you flip it. I mean, you could use logic and a little bit of algebra and figure that out in a variety of ways, but how long is 400 going to last us or what's the length of the order cycle? I just like to remember D divided by Q, that's the number of orders a year. Flip it. That's the length of the order cycle. Okay, now if I do that, I'm saying 400 divided by 8,000, which is to say on my calculator, if I'm answering that question, what I'm looking at is 0.05. Oh, how much time passes between placing one order and placing a net, the next order? 0.05. 0.05 what? Anybody know how that, see how that works? It's the length of time, 0.05, the percent of the year. Yeah, because D was a year, then that is 0.05 years. It's 5% of a year, right? Sort of a similar uh, thing that you have to be cautious about, uh, taking it back to exam one and, um, for instance, the uh, queuing models. What is it that they're actually answering in? If you use my method, say Q divided by D, your answer is going to come back in years. And again, you can easily translate that into anything else because that's not very intuitive. I mean, if somebody wanted to know, they're not going to be very satisfied if you say, oh, 5% of a year, how long is that? That is probably why they told us there's 250 working days in a year. You know, we didn't use this for anything here. There are 250 working days in a year. So if I said, you know, 0.05 times that 250, I am translating our answer to 12.5 working days, which would probably be a lot more meaningful to the people who are actually dealing with the policy. Oh, you'll be ordering every 12 and a half working days. There'll be a new order arriving every 12 and a half working days. 400, that lasts us about 12 and a half working days. These are all the order cycle. What is the most we'll ever have in inventory? That's easy. I mean, you can think of a formula as you want, Q, but look at the, um, the sawtooth diagram that's the underlying assumption. This is the most that's ever in inventory for any one of the policies that we uh, drew, and that is the size of the order. We're saying, well, you know, briefly, a new order should arrive just as you run out, and you'll have all 400 in inventory. So, you know, why do we care about this? You better make enough room in the storage room to store up to 400. That's maximum inventory. Then it says, on average, how much would we have in inventory? That's the Q divided by 2 that's embedded inside the total cost formula. You say, well, yeah. You know, we use it at a steady rate, so on average, there's about 200 in inventory. Could be as much as 400. So, these are all questions about our policy. Any questions on that? The use of the formulas actually is really simple. The one thing to try to train your mind in early on, because it's hard to unlearn, is that the EOQ formula, because that's another good candidate for a formula sheet, that gives you the very best order size. 
the total cost formula is more generic. You can use it or be commissioned to use it for any order size. Suppose they ordered 400, or suppose they ordered 800 a year, you know, what would their total uh, annual costs be? You would put the 800 in, even though that's not necessarily what the EOQ is. Okay, so those two things go together, but they're separate that way. One of them's really specific, the best order size, the other one's a more general tool, any order size. Okay, now if you turn the page, you'll see that there's another cousin of the EOQ, the EOQ with price breaks. If you are given a, uh, a discount for ordering more, then how much should there be? Oh, now we're looking at no page 94 and talking about going way back, way back before even the queuing models, way back to what would have been our second day of class. Do you guys remember that we had a snowstorm? Right, we took a snow day? Yes. We took a snow day, and so like in leading up to the first exam, I said, oh, why don't we skip the break-even point, because I know you've had that in another class. Uh, I was taking a little tuck in the material, because we're missing that day. This is the other tuck in the material that I'd like to take. This is just a variation on the EOQ. We were going to talk about the EOQ and two of its variations. But, so you know what? We'll talk about the EOQ and one of its variations, and if you ever need to, you can look up. It actually, there are dozens of variations uh, on this model that have been published. So I'd say let's skip this. Let's skip EOQ with price breaks, which is to say skip that. Skip this, and I won't put this type of problem exactly on the third exam, obviously. So you already know something that will be mentioned weeks from now in the exam three study guidelines. Because we had a snow day, and I don't want us to be in a hurry at the end of the semester. This is no page 96. Oh, and I almost drew a, a X where I shouldn't. I'm up to no page 97. Don't, don't drop through that one. Because this, I said, we'll look at the EOQ and two of its cousins. No, 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 we'll drop one of its cousins. This is the other cousin. We're keeping this cousin. Because, oh, it says across the top of the page, the uh, case of non-instantaneous replenishment. Uh, what? All right. This is what I wrote on the agenda as the EPQ. And before we go over what's that supposed to stand for, let me explain. What's this business about non-instantaneous replenishment? This is a sawtooth diagram. I mean, it's meant to be a place to draw a sawtooth diagram. So we don't really need exact numbers. But a sawtooth diagram, you know, it's like an EKG. This is time, except what we're measuring is inventory levels. And let's say there is something that we use at a constant rate. Uh, so we need to order some more. Well, we would draw that policy in action, except, well, don't draw anything yet. I want to change the setting. Because the EOQ, which a Professor Harris first published like over a century ago, is still wildly popular in, for instance, retailing. That's the EOQ. It's the one we talked about. And you say, well, yeah, okay. Um, where else would you be ordering stuff? Well, there are other settings in which you do need to think of a smart order size. But it's not retailing. It's very often some type of production or manufacturing because it's something that you use. You say, well, okay, well, still, you just try to figure out an order size, right? Like for something that you use. Uh, true. This was shortly after the EOQ was published and actually became widely adopted, you know, fairly fast. Ooh, a really easy way to, to recognize a good order size. A certain group started to protest, and they're the manufacturers. They said, wait a minute, that formula, the two formulas really that we were looking at, they were based 
on the sawtooth, the geometry of that sawtooth diagram. And what that sawtooth diagram was illustrating, which seems like what we're just about to illustrate again, was the delivery of orders. Remember, every time there was none, I just said, OK, right, this queue, the order size, it arrives, the order arrives, your inventory shoots up to this, and then we use it, and then it shoots up to queue again, and then we use it, right? Well, what that was an illustration of was the delivery of an order, or what's known more academically as instantaneous replenishment. You order 400, you don't necessarily get 400 at that moment that you order it. There can still be this thing, leaked time. But here's the idea. When the delivery arrives, 400 arrive all at once. Well, that doesn't seem like that's un that unrealistic unless you're the person that makes this stuff. If you make this stuff, you know, and then you use it in something else, it's like a component. Just because you want 400, you know, we're really running low, doesn't mean that you can go poof like a genie and 400 just appear, right? You'd have to sit down and get to work. Think about how that changes the geometry of the diagram. Because let's say there's some order size and we don't even need to pick a number. This is just whatever that number is, 2,000, 5,000, 400. That's your favorite order size. Every time you're running low, right, then you put in another order for that. Well, here's the thing. You put in, like here's you saying, hey, we're running low. Make us another batch of Q. Someone's going to sit down with the machine, and they're going to get to work making these until they've made all of them. But see how I drew that line slanted? Because there's this period of time that they're busy. They're at work making this. It doesn't appear all at once. And there's an important term for that. That's known as runtime, just loosely, generally speaking, whether you're using the EPQ or not. If you order up a batch of something, it takes a certain amount of time for the batch to be finished. We call that the runtime. Um, oh, you see, well, now, wait a minute. I drew that in ink, right? I really kind of shouldn't have done that. I'm going to have to pick a distinctly contrasting color for my sawtooth diagram because a sawtooth diagram is an illustration of inventory levels over time. And that that I drew in ink right here is not inventory levels. That's cumulative production, which is going to come back at the beginning of chapter 11. Now, for now, you're just saying, well, what's, what's the difference? The difference is in chapter 10, we assume that demand is constant. You remember that? That means that even as that person is working, somebody is running over and rating the output because it's being used at a steady rate. I mean, for this warmer color to be the actual sawtooth diagram. The inventory levels will rise because hopefully it's not being used as fast as it can be made. But nonetheless, the inventory levels by the time the batch is finished is somewhat less than the size of the batch because we've used some. You know, hot off the press, even as it was being made, we rated some of that stock and we've already used it. Now, the batch is finished, they shut off the machine. I find that's the easiest way to think about it, as if a machine is making something steadily. And then we just coast on however much we have left in inventory until we run out, of which we order up another batch to be started. Let me get a similar looking slope here. And this is what the sawtooth diagram looks like under production conditions. EPQ stands for economic production quantity. What is the perfect amount to make when you're the one that actually makes the stuff. Now, the sawtooth diagram in a certain sense, I mean, looks highly similar, but the geometry is not the same. There are some things that are exactly the same. For instance, the length of the base of one of the teeth, like from here to here, that is the order cycle. That did not change. And everything that went along with that, you know, that is how long this batch size lasts us, 
right? That is the interval of time between starting a batch and starting another batch. Um, what is a little more complicated than last time is that our order cycle is actually split into two distinct phases. Right here, let's see if I have any. This is the phase in which we are both producing and consuming. Simultaneously. And then this is the phase where we're just coasting off what we've built up in inventory. So that's sort of like a consumption only phase. And it's this change in the nature of the shape that motivates this cousin. You'll notice this. It's similar to the EOQ, but the formulas don't work exactly the same. It's because of the formulas were based on the geometry. This is all still your inventory burden right here. Same thing as last time. This is a picture of two uh, order cycles, which means to say if that was an entire year, that would be two orders uh, a year. Now. This is a typical EPQ problem. Before, I, before we actually just copy out the, it just, it just revises the formula somewhat. I want to point something out. With this material, the EOQ and its cousins, uh, we said, all right, well, you know what? We're going to simplify. We're not going to do EOQ with price, price breaks. So the only thing that you'd have to recognize is, is it an EOQ formula or is it an EPQ formula? It's one cousin. And that's important because it's two different sets of formulas, and you want to get the correct set of formulas to get the correct answer. How do you know if you're just looking at something, am I supposed to use those EOQ formulas or am I supposed to do something different? What is it that you actually watch for? Suppose we must produce 500 of some SKU annually. Now, that's the same as last time. It says we must produce, but that's apparently the demand. So. I'm marking up one of these problems. I always write D equals 500. That's the same as last time. There are 250 working days in a year. Yeah, that's probably just going to be used later for some sort of adjustment. And we can produce 50 units a day. If you're reading some sort of scenario and it tells you anything about how fast something is made, 50 units a day, it's an EPQ problem. If it doesn't provide any information about how fast it's made, it's by default an EOQ, EOQ, the first one that we did, okay? But there you see it right there. That's the um, dead giveaway, so to speak. We can produce 50 units a day. Tells us we're in an EPQ problem because we write that lower case P for production rate, 50 a day. Uh, over here, I had just noted that we had found uh, D, D equals 500. I, I like marking up problems this way because you just wind up needing these parameters put in formulas. It costs us $10 to set up production regardless of the size of the batch. Perfect. This actually didn't change from last time, even though the setting changed. That is still capital S. Capital S is the fixed cost. And it said regardless of the size of the batch, that makes it S. So, uh, anything else? Oh, and it costs us $1.25 to hold one unit in inventory for an entire year. That's perfect. You know, last time we had to do a little arithmetic to figure out what H was, capital H, the cost of holding one unit in inventory for a year. This problem just gives it to us. So, okay, well, I have all of these. What is the total annual order size or batch size under these conditions? It's a total cost formula. The first part of it will look familiar. D divided by Q times S. You know, the Q is the batch size, right? Uh, the second part is not the same as last time. Let me carefully copy it. Uh, okay. Now, I want to point something out. This is the same as last time, and its interpretation is the same as last time. 
if you are trying to figure out what the total setup costs for a batch is annually, this total fixed cost is still this half. If you're trying to figure out what the total holding costs are for some order size or batch size, that's still the second half that has the H in it for holding. This has not changed. This right in here, cover up the S, is still the total number of orders or batches a year. And, and actually, cover up the H, this, the meaning of it hasn't changed. The actual formula has changed since last time, but that is still your average inventory right there. That's the formula for average inventory. Oh, okay. So, what order size minimizes total cost? Well, this is produced actually with that same exercise of taking the first derivative with uh, respect to Q and setting it equal to zero, but here's the result. D times, oops, it's actually the EOQ at the beginning. 2 times D times S times H. I wanted to write it exactly like we wrote it last time, so don't pay any attention to that blot right there. Except, wait a minute, there's an adjustment. You have to multiply it by the square root of lowercase p divided by lowercase p minus lowercase d. So it actually asks the question, what minimizes the total cost? Um, so we could fill that out. So um, let me think, oh, actually let me do this. I didn't leave myself quite so much room. Let's take a look at this expression. Now I'll write it neater. The EPQ begins with the old EOQ, but there's an adjustment. You multiply it by that. So now we fill it in. Okay, 2 times, this time, because I'm looking over there on the screen, D is 500, right? Let's fill out the formula. This time, the fixed cost, S, is 10. This time, for this problem, H is, they just told us, $1.25. I calculate that, and I multiply that times the square root of P. We said, oh, yeah, P, 50. That's what tells you you're in an EPQ problem. Divided by 50 minus, oops. We don't have a value for that, right? It's the lowercase d. I want to point out one thing. It's not tricky, but one thing that's a little intricate about the EPQ. What is this supposed to be, a lowercase d? You see it actually in both formulas. That is daily demand. The way to think about it is in this chapter, and actually basically through the rest of the book, and actually it's kind of a tradition, in um, building these models. You know how capital D is annual demand? Remember, capital D is always annual demand. So we're always looking for how much do you need a year, or how much do you sell a year. Think of lowercase d as its cousin, right? Lowercase d. Lowercase d is daily demand. Well, we don't have daily demand. We only have annual demand. How are we gonna get daily demand? It didn't say how much you needed a day. Yep, it's just gen generally, sometimes like if you're, more, more practically speaking, if you're working a problem, sometimes it's quoted, right, with a daily demand of blah. Or sometimes you just have to do a little bit of reasoning. We must produce 500 of some stock keeping unit annually. There's 250 working days in a year. I knew we were going to use that for something, right? It'd have to tell you how many days you're supposed to plan for you just say 500 divided by 250. If we're always using this at a steady rate, then apparently we use this at a rate of two a day. Oh, okay. That's the number that belongs there. Divided by two. We had to reason that for ourselves, 500 divided by 250, daily demand. Then we have everything we need. Put that in your calculator. Oh, I did that. And it comes, this one, unlike the last one, comes out a little bit messy. Something like 91.287 by the time you take the square roots and stuff like that. Of which this is not a helpful suggestion 
to somebody who's asking, well, how much should I make? Like, how big should a batch be? So I'm pretty confident with just calling that 91. And the only thing I'm, I'm doing there is rounding. Um, OK. Oh, that's the order. OK, for this situation, that's it right there. That's the, that's the batch size that would minimize setup and holding costs, 91. Well, what's that supposed to mean? Make these 91 at a time. When you're running low, sit down and make 91 of them. Um, OK. Uh, now, oh, so now we have a policy, because we're going to do that. So Q equals 91 from this point forward. So that everything else that we do, we were just asking questions about the policy. Uh, like, I think there is one at the bottom of the page, right? If Q, if the absolute perfect Q is 91, how much time would pass between production setup? Oh, how much time would pass between production setups? That's the same thing as the order cycle. So, you know, my favorite method is just take D divided by Q and flip it and ask yourself the question, okay, 91 at a time, how much is that of 500? So I did that and I got 0 0.182. And I said, oh yeah, but that's in years. So again, just to make it more intuitive, well, if you take 0 0.182 and you multiply it times that 250, how many working days is it? It's a lot. It's like 45 and a half working days. But that's your answer if somebody's saying, well, if we make them 91 at a time, I mean, how long is 91 going to last us a long time? Over 45 and a half working days. Okay. What is the most we'd ever have in inventory? All right, now, let me copy what seems like another formula to keep track of so that we can just calculate it. And then remind me to show you a shortcut. Last time, the most that we'd ever have in inventory was simple. It was the size of the order. That was the EOQ. The problem is, is that that's not the case here because by the time the order is done, we've already used some. So that's not the answer. This is the answer, this expression. So to just fill it out for here, we say, all right, 91 times 50 minus 2 divided by 50. I get 87.36. So our answer would be if somebody was asking how much, what's the most we'd ever have sitting around, we'd say usually about 87. Maybe sometimes it would peak out at 88. I'm just wobbling around the 87.36. Okay, so now we know how much storage space to set aside. Then you see it says on average how much would we have in inventory. On, oh, you need a different formula. Well, sort of. This is the formula for average inventory. You can repeat all those calculations from scratch if you want. I get 43.68. But I want to point something out. You don't have to remember these in particular if you can remember two things. I'm turning the page back. This is the total cost formula, right? And I said, oh yeah, this, perfect thing for a formula sheet. And you already know, all right, the whole thing calculates total cost, cover up this half, this half calculates holding cost, cover up the H, What's in the box right here is average inventory. That's the formula for average inventory. It's inside the total cost formula. Just look what is next to the H. Well, what about the other one, the one for maximum, right? Because it's different. Yes, but you don't have to remember it exactly if you can remember this principle. In chapter 10, maximum inventory is always twice average. Everybody hear that? Maximum inventory is always double the average. Think of the simpler EOQ. Average inventory was Q divided by 2, and maximum was Q. This, if you need to know maximum inventory, go to the total cost formula, find that expression right in here, calculate it, that's the average, then double it, there's your maximum. 
That's what that expression is. If you look at it, it's the same thing, except um, I didn't write a two because it's double this expression right here. Everybody see that? OK, so it's pretty much all in there. The only thing that's like not exactly in there is just logic. The one last question you see there about runtime. What is the runtime of our ordering policy? That, right. How long does it actually take you to make an order? You know, how long is it from just here to just here? Well, you can memorize this if you want, but think about it. You have a batch size, right? You're going to make Q. And you have a rate at which you work. That's P. We make these at 50 a day. Divide the rate into the batch size, and that's telling you how long it's going to take you to actually make it. Oh, so in our case, 91 divided by 50. We're, we're making these 91 at a time, and we can make 50 in a day. So how many days is it going to take? Uh, not very many days, less than two working days, to complete a batch. The runtime is less than two days, a runtime of 1.82 days. Does anybody have a sense why we got such a small number? I mean, that's how, you, that's how you calculate that. But for this particular problem, you know, that we put, you know, I provided a scenario and we determined that we should make these 91 at a time. Uh, we discovered that the cycle time was 45 and a half days. You make 91, it's going to last you 45 and a half days, of which we just now determined of the 45 and a half days, you're going to spend less than two of them actually working. There's a, there's a reason that that came out that way, and it has to do with the numbers that I chose for the scenario in the first place. I was cooking the numbers to get something that was sort of a little biased that way. It's coming from the fact that the numbers I chose for, you know, production rate, we can make 50 a day, is way bigger than how fast we use it, only two. That's what's creating a situation. If you were to draw a sawtooth diagram, for this problem in particular to scale, it wouldn't look very different from the EOQ, right? The first half of the triangle would be only a tiny bit slanted because the runtime's only two days, right? But the rest of the order cycle is 45 and a half. It would look almost like a right triangle from the EOQ. Oh, right. Because if you think about it, how do these two things relate? Cover that up. This is the EOQ. It's just that when you're in this production environment, you've got to remember to do this adjustment before you recommend a batch size. And that adjustment is P divided by P minus D. You do take the square root. As P gets larger and larger and larger, the faster and faster and faster and faster we actually can produce, right? D is fixed. Do you see how? This is turning into one. Think about it. We put a 50 here and a 50 here. There's a two here. Now just make it arbitrarily larger. We can make these at 500 a day. OK, put a 500 and a 500 there, and then a two. We can make these 5,000. I'm cranking up our production rate, 5,000, 5,000, and two. This whole thing's just turning into one, right? Because the faster and faster and faster you can produce, the more and more it looks like batches just do appear instantaneously, and the whole thing goes back where we started from. So, any questions on that? Yeah? Well, the decimal that we figured out for the order cycle and the runtime thing, did those just happen to be like the same number, just a different decimal uh, point? The decimal for the runtime? Yeah, like it was 91 out of five, like 91 divided by 500, right. and it came out to 0.182. Yeah. And then this was 1.82. Was that just like, that just coincidence? Um, yeah, I think so. Okay. You know, I never noticed that coincidence before. <laughs> Interesting. Um, well, actually, no, it's not. It's not coincidence, but we might. We. I. That's it's very sharp eyes. It's not coincidence because of the number of working days, but I don't know how valuable it is at a practical level just working these problems to see that. But well spotted, yeah, just to see that link. 
All right, now, this, all this stuff that we've been doing is all been to figure out how much to order. Because all the rest of these questions are just answering questions about the consequences of ordering that much. We can't leave chapter 10, which is inventory management, until we talk about when should you order. And in chapter 10, the answer to that question, when should I order, is known as a reorder point. Oh, okay, so we have hit on actually a very important keyword here, a reorder point. Now, there's the simplest of examples on this page. It says, suppose demand is constant at 10 units a day. That means you're responsible for something. Like there's this magical store that you're minding, and customers always buy 10 of something by the end of the day, and always just 10. OK, it's a thought exercise. And the lead time on an order is five days. That means that you call up the vendor because we're running low. You will always wait exactly five days before they wheel in the delivery. It doesn't matter how much you ordered. You could have ordered another 10 or you could have ordered 10 million. Notice the assumption here? Okay, but it's always, you always have to wait five days. So this question right here is just asking you to reason through when you should order. If we always sell 10 a day and it always takes five days for more stuff to get here, when should I order? When I'm down to my last, I don't want to run out, right? 50, yeah. Yeah, you, this, you, you just use, okay, yeah, well, you know, when you're down to, when you're down to 50, because that will last you while you wait, right? Then, then you should place the order. You, you just, you just completed your first, first reorder point policy. And it's for what's known rather loftily as the uh, constant demand, constant lead time case. But nonetheless, it's a reorder point policy. Yes, when uh, you look, oh, wait a minute, and it doesn't matter how simplified it is, it demonstrates exactly how reorder points work. I said, oh, you know, now it's time to figure out when you should place an order. Notice that in chapter 10, when we order is not a point in time, it's an amount, it's a signal. And this will come back actually in some later chapters. It's a signal. When you're down to 50, oh, there's 50 left on the shelf, that's the signal, place an order. Okay, now we should add some symbolics to this, just because we're then gonna use them later in a different situation. But I asked you to reason through, here's another important key word or key phrase from uh, chapter 10. I only wrote DDLT. I didn't want to write out demand during lead time. Setting a smart reorder point is all about DDLT, what will demand during lead time be? And you could reason that for that, it's D times LT, the lowercase d is still daily demand, right? Just where we left it with the EPQ. And the lead time was the five, right? <coughs> so what you said was 10 times five, yeah. That, that makes sense. You order when we have 50 left. Another way to think about the 50 is that if it's five days worth of stuff, right? I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't articulate that that way to somebody that you were trying to impress, but basically that's what the 50 is. It's five days worth of stuff. That's when it's time uh, to place a new order. So it gets here in time. Okay, now on that page, it goes on. It's a supposed demand varies a little bit. Sometimes it's nine, sometimes it's 10, and sometimes it's 11. So the assumption is, is that the LT, the lead time part of it, that stays the same. It's always five days. This is 
getting towards being a little more realistic, you don't sell or consume exactly the same amount every day. Sometimes I sell for 10 cents, whatever. Okay, but the question's the same. Like, now what? When, when, when should we reorder? What should the rear point be? Anybody have any suggestions? You could average them. It looks like if you averaged them, they would average to 10, right? So we're back to 50. We could do that. The rear point would be 50. We have a way of rationalizing how we got it. Of course, if we reorder at 50 under these conditions, every so often at least, we're not exactly sure how often something, though, will probably happen. What's the problem? It's, you know, it's, I'm saying that's a you know, rational answer, but there's a, there is a, 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 a problem or a hitch to it, right? What would happen just every so often? Maybe short, yeah. Because each day, since we don't know, right, we, we could, we th you know, think about it like rolling dice, five of them. I mean, we might have, we might have a stretch of really busy days, right? Uh, we might have a stretch of really busy days, a bunch of 11s, and so that by the end of the five days, actually, we came up short. And it's true if you think about it, if we reorder at 50 under these conditions, the opposite could be true as well. Because what we, what we really like in terms of holding costs is for our orders to arrive just as we run out, right? Uh, because that's really ideally when they should arrive. They shouldn't arrive on top of any old inventory, ideally. If we reorder at 50, the opposite could also happen. I mean, there could be a series of slow days. And in fact, there are three or four left. And say, so, yeah, OK. Uh, if, you, if you really didn't like the idea of running out, there is, you can rationalize a reorder point. It's like, it's like, no, 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 we don't want to be out. Well, the only way to be safe is to reorder at what? Hmm? The 11, if I'm, if reorder 55, yeah, 11 times 5? You know, that would cover you in all cases. You'd have to have five consecutive days of high demand, but you'd still have enough. But then that's a case that most of the time when the new order arrived, if you were reordering at 55, it would land on top of old inventory because most of the time you wouldn't go through 55, probably on average. Probably on average we go through about 50. This is something, this particular case, that if we wanted more exact numbers, we would have to look at a little bit more detail because it's assuming what's known as a uniform distribution. And actually, practically speaking, the best way to investigate is to simulate it. And there is a spreadsheet simulation on UB Learns. It looks like this. The issue is always demand during lead time, right? Because we pick our order size based on that. Did you know, have you done this in any other classes? It's kind of fun. You can get Excel to pick numbers at random. I'm going to use the formula ran between. Ran between 9 and 11. It's just a formula that every time I press F9, which is recalculate for Excel, it picks between 9 and 11 at random. Of course, that's just simulating one day. I fill that formula into the five cells that represent the five days, and here we go. There is a particular lead time in which we needed 49. There's another one in which we needed 48, 50. 50 would so far have held well. 47, 50, oh, 51. There's our first instance in which uh, 50 wouldn't have been enough. This is typically how spreadsheet simulations are done. I just clicked to the page. When you open this uh, spreadsheet, I invite you to play with it. It opens, it's safe to open to blank lead time. That's where I was at. But there's a tab, just click on it, reorder point simulation. And it's just lead time, placing an order simulated over and over and over again several hundred times. Because you're just trying to pick a smart reorder point, right? But you're wondering what the frequency of these things are. So there's a series of columns that just test for what we're concerned about, primarily stock out. Because, oh, right, if you uh, open this from UB Learns, it's saved with 50. That's a perfectly rational uh, starting point. And what it's indicating here is that if you use 50, we stock out 
let me think, 42% of the time. It's also querying if there was any old inventory that got landed on, if there was any extra here. And it is rolling up that information right there. Oh, right, because the top of the page that you're actually taking notes on says something about you know choosing your reorder point, um, taking chances, and it mentions two other really strategic concepts that, you know, in the conversation, I hadn't dropped those terms before, service level and safety stock. This, right, this brings up the issue of service level and safety stock. Service level, the probability, demand will not exceed supply. during lead time. That's the thing that we were worried about with the 50. Sometimes you would run out. What's the probability? OK, service level is the probability that you won't run out. For a given reorder point, like is that a good idea or not? It's service level tells you the probability that if you use it, you won't run out. Its opposite is known as stock at risk, the probability that you will run out. Safety stock, that's the flip side of this. Safety stock has like a keyword kind of definition. Inventory held to protect against uncertainty. Inventory held to protect, protect against uncertainty. Actually, whoops, yes. It's right there. In chapter 10, we can be even more specific. Your reorder point, because that's what we're trying to pick, is your average demand during lead time, remember the 50, plus any amount of safety stock. You choose to pad it with to protect you against the fact that's only an average and you're not exactly certain how many people are gonna come in over the next five days. These two things work against each other, but they're the two things you're working with when you're just trying to pick ROP. You're just trying to pick a reorder point. So I'll go back here. And what this is saying for our simple example is that if you reorder at 50 for this particular set of simulated lead times, 58% of the time you had enough. So it's a service level of 58%. If I press F9, that's going to wobble a little bit because these are picked at random, but it's still, it's going to give us an idea. Now it's 59, 62, 61, 60. I could get it to be a little bit more stable if I simulated and averaged together more lead times. But it's telling us that, yeah, it looks like if we reorder at 50, 60% of the time we'll have enough, which means 40% of the time generally we won't. Uh, simulated safety stock, if we reorder at 50 uh, on average, a little bit less than one is still sitting there when it gets there. Now, if we don't like the 60%, that just doesn't seem like polite or safe enough, well, then you know this gives you a means of experimenting. What if we increase it to 51, reorder 51? Do you see how the, the simulated service level jumped, went up to 79? Let me see if it wobbles much, 79, 78, kind of peaking out at 80%, but the safety stock went up. Now, hopefully, this had better work. If I put in 55, we should get, yes, a 100% service level, right? There's no way to run out if you reorder at 55. But it says simulation safety stock 4.89. What that means is, is that it's, if you are reordering at 55, on average, there's almost five unused ones still sitting there. And you say, well, okay, well, you know, I think we're, I get the idea of the service level, you know, being of service to a customer. Obviously, we want that to be a big number, so isn't just 55 the answer? Uh, okay. Go back to the safety stock. He said, you know, wh wh why are we even introducing that? Uh, why do we care about that? Here's, here's the idea. 
that average amount that's sitting there when a new order gets there, that is, go back to a sawtooth diagram. That is technically, theoretically, a layer of inventory that never moved throughout the year. If on, now it's true, if you look from one of the other of these, it's, you know, sometimes there's seven left over, sometimes there's as few as four, here there were as few as two, here there was seven. It averages to 4.89. If you want to use a reorder point of 55, you have made a commitment to keeping 4.89 of these units in inventory for the entire year. Or you've done the equivalent of that. And you say, okay, I still why do I care? Because of H, you're going to pay on top of everything else for those. Oh, right. So perhaps we look for a balance between these two. Now, with this particular problem, really, we had to build a simulation. And that's because of the distribution of the original demand during lead time. Most classic business analysis problems and systems, they don't assume this distribution. This is what's known as a uniform discrete distribution. If you just get interested in like building simulations and stuff, you uh, start to learn the names of lots of distributions. No, 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 no. Uh, the, the, classic, the classic formula for determining the best reorder point is not based on that assumption. It is based on what nowadays some people say is a questionable assumption in the modern world, but it is still the favorite assumption of business analysis. It's based on the assumption that demand during lead time is normally distributed. We try very hard to draw a nice normal bell-shaped curve. Oh, right, now this is note page um, 101. This is all different levels of demand during lead, lead time, you know, like 9, 10, or, or 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53. And then this is the probability that you would actually see that. Why are we drawing this? Because, oh, there it is. It gives us an image to collect together a couple very important, I don't know, concepts or elements we just talked about. Now, the, the traditional uh, symbol for the mean of a normal distribution is mu. We've seen that before, and you've seen it in other classes. In this case, we're talking about the average demand during lead time. Like if the average demand during lead time was 50, that's what this point would be right here. It is, for a normal distribution, the most likely value. You would most likely see that, right? And we're talking about setting a reorder point. You can illustrate that. Because, like, say, this number is 50, and we decide to set the reorder point at 53. What we're doing is we're saying, well, okay, this is everything that could possibly happen, and we'll reorder right there. That's what that would look like. That's what that would look like. This is meant to represent every possible thing that could happen. As long as what happens is less than this number, then we're happy, right? We had enough. We were able to serve all the customers. Although there's a couple scenarios here that are trapped to the right. That's where we didn't have enough. We now have an image for service level versus safety stock. Or excuse me, versus uh, stock out risk. We actually also have an image of safety stock, but I haven't labeled it yet. Because what I am indicating in yellow, that is your service level. And then this is everything in which a customer would be disappointed. That's your stock out risk. Your safety stock is the distance right in here.
That is what these things look like under these assumptions. So we just need to place an order. Any one of these things in here could happen. The height of the curve over it is the probability that it would happen. This is on average. This is what we need during lead time. So we decide, you know what, we're not, we're not going to reorder based on the average because it might be kind of, we don't know, it might be kind of a little crazy in the next couple of days. So we'll pad that number somewhat, right, to get a reorder point. The amount that we pad it is the safety stock. The amount of this mystical curve that represents everything that could possibly happen to us each time we place an order, all the different levels of demand during lead time, the amount of it that's to the left is the service level. And the amount that got amputated, it's still to the right. That's the risk that you're running. Now, there's one last traditional statistical symbol and parameter associated with the normal curve that I haven't added to this illustration, right? I said, oh, you know, this is right here where it's the tallest. That must be mu. It's mean, right? Which for us in this situation would be average demand during lead time. There's always two things that describe a normal distribution completely. One is where is its center? And the other one is basically how misbehaved is it? What is its variance? How much does it vary around that center? Because I haven't attached any numbers to this illustration, but I could tell you, let me try to draw something that has a higher variance like that. Now we have two, I've marked this up, now we have two different normal curves uh, drawn on the same graph. They both have the same average. Maybe these are like two different items. And on average, you know, on average you need the same uh, in each case for each of the two items. But be careful about their reorder points because I was trying to draw something that had a lower variance, right? Uh, see how it doesn't grab as much of everything as could possibly? Yeah, it doesn't vary as much. One of them is more, pre this one that I sketched is more predictable than the other one, which is to say that if we used a reorder point for this item, this reorder point, we should have 100% service level because I'm implying that none of it's amputated to the right even though it has the same average amount. Oh, okay, which is saying with demand during lead time, we really need to know two things. We need to be confident of them. On average, how much do you need and how much does it vary around that average? Given that you have those two things, you can set a reorder point for any system. Oh, now, if you turn the page, you see a little bit of information in which we are getting set to do exactly that, right? Actually, the first thing here is evaluate a reorder point, and then the second thing here is to actually set a reorder point. Um, we were talking about it in the abstract here. Now we're actually attaching some numbers, see variance of 50. I think, though, we got a couple minutes left in class. This would be a good stopping place. You know me and pages. We're between pages. Let's stop here and we'll just pick up with that and we'll finish it uh, on Thursday. Thanks.